Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we are talking about domestic abuse with today's guests, Elizabeth Abdul Rahim, Executive Director of Choices for Victims of Domestic Violence in the Columbus, Ohio region, Nancy Freehalf, President and CEO of Partnership Against Domestic Violence in Atlanta, Georgia, and Deborah Vagans, President and CEO of the National Network to End Domestic Violence in Washington, D.C. And thank you so much for joining us, panel, and a reminder to Zoom attendees that we would take three SNAP polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. So it's great to have you all here to talk about this very important topic. Domestic violence is such a epidemic in this country and has been for so long. Um, and it is something that we really do have to deal with. Elizabeth, why don't you uh, start us off by talking about your experiences in Columbus, Ohio, and how you are dealing with this uh, ongoing pandemic of domestic violence. Sure, thank you so much for having me today. So here um, at Choices for Victims of Domestic Violence, we are the only um, shelter in the Columbus, Ohio area for victims of domestic violence. And we work specifically with victims of intimate partner violence. And it's important to make that distinction because there are other types of domestic violence, but we work specifically with what we call IPV. Um, we have a 24 hour hotline. We have a shelter that has 120 beds plus cribs. We do community advocacy. So for people who don't necessarily need shelter, but they need other services, legal advocacy. We do clinical counseling in the community. Um, we have a small transitional housing program for people who don't fit into um, some of the more traditional housing resources that are available in our area. And then we also do support groups and education groups and outreach and education. So those are our basic services here in Columbus to see a little bit of the scope. Last year, we received over 4,000 calls to our hotline, and we um, provided over 44,500 nights of shelter to people. And our shelter is available to everybody who's a victim of intimate partner violence, so it doesn't matter the gender of the person, if they have children, if they don't have children, the shelter is open to everybody who is in imminent risk and needs safe shelter um, in the evening. We also have a kennel connected to our shelter, so people are able to bring their pets in with them, which has made a big difference in people who are willing to access shelter, right? Because it's not just as a shelter there, are people, do people feel that it's a safe and appropriate answer to what they need right there at the moment? And that's one of the things that we are working on and everybody, of course, in domestic violence is working on all the time is, is this opportunity safer and better and more appropriate? Because one of the things we know is that people stay when they feel like the options aren't options that are actually meeting their needs. So we're always looking at how does that work? So of course in COVID, that was a decision people were making all the time, right? Is does it make sense to move my family and my children into communal living at this time? Um, but on the other hand, we are sheltering with our abusers. So people who had been sort of sticking it out, saying it's not that bad, I go to work, he goes to work, the kids go to school, you know, we have a few hours in the evening. Now everybody's at home in the house all the time. And we saw a huge drop in calls, as I think many people did, because people were unable to call, they were unable to find a safe space to call. We found that the people who did make it to shelter were more visibly injured and we're often running faster. So for example, somebody who raced out of her house, got to the local fire department, and the call was actually made from the fire department. So um, during COVID, what we needed to know was we had to be available to take people in immediately. Um, and we were, we were able to do that and continue to be able to do that. We had our intake open all the time, and I think that was super important for us in our community. You're making a number of very important points. First of all, the definition of intimate partner as opposed to spousal um, uh, uh, violence. Um, intimate partner is a much more uh, uh, all-encompassing um, definition. Uh, you're also talking about the fears that people have in coming into a group care situation in which during the pandemic, people are, uh, might be being abused, they might be suffering greater abuse, but they have great fear about coming into contact with others during this pandemic. 
And then you were also talking about the cooperation between various first responders, in this uh, case, the, the, uh, the, the people who deal with fires and, and other um, uh, tragedies, uh, but also uh, law enforcement and how the cooperation between the nonprofit sector and, and the, uh, the, the government and protective services sector um, function. Nancy, uh, in, in your area, um, how do you um, serve your communities? And could you uh, run down some of the same type of statistics that, uh, that Elizabeth just shared with us? Sure. Well, and again, thank you for shedding light on this important topic. I always say that domestic violence loves darkness. So the more that we can do to bring it into the light, um, the more likely we are to really have a community wide um, effect. Our mission is to end the crime of intimate partner violence and empower its survivors. Um, I'd say that our services are, are very similar um, to what Elizabeth talked about. And another component of what we do is our team dating violence program. So we work very robustly with youth, college age um, students again, to really uh, meet our mission of ending the crime, because we know the younger that we can get to folks, the more likely that we are to do that. Um, COVID has been an uh, extreme challenge on our organization. We run two shelters, do a lot of work in the community, do legal advocacy. We've kept our shelters open. I think one of my big challenges has been how do I make sure those services remain available while at the same time protecting the safety and well-being of our staff. And how many people do, do you serve on an annual basis in the Atlanta area? Okay, well, we answer about 8,000 um, crisis calls a year, and we serve about 300 individuals between our two shelters. We serve over 5,000 people with um, legal advocacy and temporary protective orders. So, uh, and we serve about, we reach about 20,000 people through our community outreach services. So another big challenge is how do we continue to have that impact on that education and awareness in the community and do it all virtually when nobody's going anywhere. Are you also providing services to people who um, uh, very often, uh, let's, let's face it, domestic violence is perpetrated by men and very often against women. Uh, are you um, providing services for people who might be sliding into becoming abusers themselves? Um, and, and are trying not to, uh, to have that slide? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't provide those services. Actually, um, I don't know the laws, but the policies in Georgia for domestic violence programs is they not provide services for abusers, but we do partner with organizations that do work with abusers. And one of the things that we do is um, any abuser that's in a program, it's a requirement that safety checks be done with the victim of that abuser. So the abuser programs contract with us and other shelters to do those safety checks. So we, we are doing those safety checks to make sure that in fact, um, re-perpetration isn't, ha isn't happening on that person. And Deborah, you probably know more about stats than I do, so I'll say one, but you may be able to say it better than I do. Um, we basically, um, our knowledge is that about 15% of victims are men and 85% women. Um, so we also do provide services in our shelter and in all of our services um, to men, uh, people of different sexual orientations, to folks that are trans transgender. So we are very clear that, um, that our services must be available to anyone that's experienced um, intimate partner violence. And Deborah, you as, a, as, as the national organization that binds together so many other groups, uh, to, the, to you these stories in these different regions in, in, uh, in the greater uh, Columbus area, in the greater Atlanta area, these stories are very familiar. It's, it's in every community, isn't it? Rural, suburban, urban, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter in what region you are, these stories are very familiar to you. Yes. Um, well, first, thank you for having me here. And thank you to my amazing co-panelists doing the hard frontline work. Um, you're right. The domestic violence, um, unfortunately, does not discriminate. It is everywhere. It is women, men, children um, who are survivors. Um, it, uh, it doesn't matter about socioeconomic class um, or, or, or background. Or race. Or, or although, although there are, uh, although unfortunately for, for, uh, for Black um, uh, survivors, survivors of color and Indigenous survivors, often the statistics are even worse. So unfortunately, 
Um, that is true, but um, it, it is unfortunate that it is everywhere. And, and because of COVID, we are seeing spikes that are happening, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, for, for NNEDV, so we are the National Network to End Domestic Violence, we um, represent the 56 state and territorial coalitions to end domestic violence, who in turn represent the nearly 2,000 local domestic violence um, programs nationwide, and we work closely with our members to understand exactly what you're talking about, the ongoing and emerging needs across the country for the programs and um, for, the ad for the survivors and the advocates. Um, and we make sure, then we take that information and we make sure that those needs are heard by policymakers at the national level. Uh, so we work on policy changes that center the experiences of survivors and victims um, such as the landmark 1994 Violence Against Women Act. And in addition to our federal policy work, we also offer um, a range of programs, trainings and initiatives to try to address the really complex causes and the far reaching consequences of domestic violence. So we will also focus on housing, technology, the intersection of, of technology and domestic violence. Um, we provide coalition support and training. We look at the intersection of HIV and domestic violence. We look at economic justice, which hopefully we can talk a little bit uh, more later about financial abuse. And we also have a, a, a legal email hotline, which has turned out to be uh, incredibly important. It's always important, but has uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in the outreach with, for legal questions during this time. We just completed a poll and uh, almost 40% of respondents said that they have experienced or witnessed domestic violence themselves. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a huge proportion. Um, one of the things that I find to be so interesting is that uh, domestic violence follows trauma. Right? People who are more traumatized, who live with greater trauma, who live with greater stress, are perpetrators of uh, and, and recipients of domestic violence. Um, and then uh, also domestic violence is a traumatizing uh, agent. How do you deal with that combination? Because you cannot resolve, Deborah, on a national basis, you, Elizabeth, on a regional basis, or Nancy, you cannot resolve the trauma that we are experiencing through either the pandemic or the subsequent economic dislocation, or certainly uh, racism, which affects native communities that were, that were raised um, and, and, um, and communities of color, you can't, you can't resolve that. Are you just solve on a, on a social wound? Um, and are you just trying to manage a, a never ending problem? How do, you, how do we fix this issue? I, I think there's a number of different components to that. I think we always, as service providers, have to um, stay conscious of the trauma that people are bringing to us. The immediate trauma, it may be long-term trauma, they may have been victimized as children um, and, and as adults. So we, um, we work really hard on trauma-informed care where we're being aware of that trauma and we're not re-traumatizing. We work really hard at understanding that um, Domestic violence is about taking away power and control. So part of our work is to help people and to, to provide them that opportunity to regain their power and control. Um, yes, absolutely. COVID on top of already, we're, we're all traumatized by COVID. COVID, I had somebody say to me, um, all of us have COVID. We may be lucky to have not had the physical illness, but we all are going through a lot because of it. Um, so we, again, have to understand that that's trauma on top of trauma for the people that we serve. Um, sometimes we deal with that by very immediate person-to-person -person assistance. We've received funds to pay rent, to buy food, to provide transportation, and sometimes just those simple things um, can have a huge impact on the trauma that people are experiencing. But I agree that, and again, that's part of our community education, that's part of our outreach, that's part of our advocacy to say, this is a societal problem and we as a society must address it. People often ask, why do women stay? What we need to ask is why do we continue to have a community and environment where we allow this to happen? Elizabeth, are you, are you finding that, that there is this direct link between uh, the trauma of poverty or the trauma of racism or uh, the trauma of the pandemic and what you're experiencing? Oh, absolutely. I think trauma is always, you know, compound trauma is just very complex. And trying to figure out where someone's trauma starts 
is is sort of a rabbit hole that isn't even necessarily productive, mm -hmm. right? Um, as Nancy said, we always work on trauma-informed care. And for us, we follow the rules-free shelter model as much as we can so that people can get back their autonomy, right? So that they are really making their own decisions and they're really setting up and they didn't go from one ultra um, structured space to a space where we are then structuring and holding the control and those sorts of things. So that's something we work at very, um, very diligently. And then COVID then sort of is in a position where we have to pull back from that a little bit, right? Because in order to keep everybody safe, we had to put more rules in place into our shelter. We had to be stricter about if people can just have a night out and things like that, because we're trying to really um, honor the shelter in place rules that our um, government has put in place, right? We understood that fundamentally our shelter is a giant family in terms of a unit, right? That everybody's living together. So then now we're sheltering in place and we have to have a few more rules and how is that affecting um, people's trauma? Is that triggering them? Things like that. So we have to be very aware of that. Um, one of the things that we did, you know, we find that often people don't like to go to support groups with people they're living with. It's a little too close, right? Um, so we opened up some adult art groups that we hadn't done in the past and provided some structured activities as everybody pulled in for shelter in place. We saw people trying to make more structure inside their family home. And so we tried to provide opportunities for people to do that in our shelter. But we have found that these adult art groups have been incredibly healing for a number of reasons. But the biggest is that they're just drop in. People can just drop in and then it sort of grows and people are able to just sort of speak about their trauma and share as they would in a support group, but without putting that sort of more clinical structure around it. And it's been very, very successful in our shelter at this time. How do you feel as punishment as a response to abuse? Um, you know, if, if, if we're saying that, that trauma is a driver of abusive behavior and, and, um, and uh, trauma is, is, and particularly stacked trauma where you have a number of different factors coming in, it seems to me that, that uh, punishment, while, while there is a uh, role for punishment, Punishment as a response to abuse is simply creating a, another series of trauma, um, both for the, the abuser uh, and also for the abused, particularly if we're talking about uh, 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 relationships that uh, do have uh, some positive aspects and some economic aspects as well. Deborah, what do you, what do you see in terms of your um, national advocacy for um, responses that are effective at reducing uh, trauma um, in society. I, I, you know, one of our approaches is that this is really a, a complex problem that needs um, uh, different solutions and, and solutions that will meet um, survivors where they are. Um, so we look at, um, obviously, when you're talking about the individual level, there's very, very important that there is enough funding, that there is trauma-informed care, that there are options, that survivors have options what, what, for what works with their communities. It's important though, when we're looking at the federal legislation, that we are looking at funding that provides services, that provides prevention, that uh, provides um, perhaps more restorative justice issues. Um, and uh, we need funding for specifically for um, culturally specific services. Um, so it's, I do think it's important to move away from this, um, uh, from a um, sort of a mass incarceration approach. And we also know that that uh, impacts communities of color in, in really terrible ways. Uh, and because of the systemic racism in our culture, um, you know, not all survivors feel comfortable um, calling police. And so punishment in that sense is not, the, is, is not the only focus of this work and it should not be the only focus of this work. It is focused on centering survivors and their needs and the supports for them and advocates and programs. And we just took a, another poll um, in which 96% of respondents and then 65% of respondents felt that uh, women were the uh, largest um, uh, uh, um, victims of domestic violence and then ch followed by children. Um, so you have a, a situation where if there is a solution, the solution needs to be targeted. 
followed by elderly and non-cisgendered uh, individuals and men. It, the solution needs to be targeted uh, appropriately. And while it is um, a, a wonderful idea that domestic violence can be solved by an event like incarceration, mm -hmm. you incarcerate somebody, you're done, mm -hmm. as opposed to a process that needs to be funded over a period of time, uh, the fact is, is that the process is, is likely way more effective in dealing with the, with the issues uh, that women and children face than the event of incarcerating um, uh, people who, who are perpetrators, right, Nancy? Well, I just want to say one thing about that. I agree it absolutely has to be a process, and I agree there's many components, and absolutely incarceration alone is not in any way going to solve the problem. On the flip side, one of the uh, very uh, often uh, factors of perpetrators is that they don't take responsibility for their behavior. It's the victim. You made and they don't stop, it. right? Right. You made me do it. If you could just cook a decent meal, if you could get the kids to shut up, if you could stop yelling at me so much. And legal intervention often can be the trigger for a perpetrator to begin to say, oh, Maybe I do have responsibility. Maybe this is affecting my life in a negative way. Maybe I do need to start looking a little bit at myself and see how I can do this different and how I can do that better. Locking the person up for even two years and then letting them out and there hasn't been that ability um, to intervene and to really help them process what they're doing and the harm that they're doing and, and teach them how they can do it differently will do absolutely no good. But as a first intervention, um, kind of a wake-up call for the perpetrator and for immediate safety for the survivor, it can be effective. That is such a great point. We have a tendency in this country to move into our left, right, or up, down uh, corners. And so often, it's just a combination of solutions, right, Elizabeth? I mean, you can't just, you can't just say, we're going to do one thing and that's going to be right for all circumstances. Absolutely, and I think that's never more true than in the space of intimate partner violence. Everything is really, truly so individualized from the custody of your children to, you know, what's happening with your home, if everybody has their name on the mortgage, all the way across. Um, and I was just also going to say, when we talk about incarceration, I don't think any of us think it's the answer to domestic violence. I think that I don't know anybody who does this work who thinks it is. However, I would say in COVID, when there was a period where um, the police were not arresting people immediately when they came to the homes due to fears of COVID in the prisons and things like that, victims weren't speaking to us on the phone. So we have a system, the Lethality Assessment Program, many, many um, areas have it, right? Where the police call into our hotline when they are at a domestic violence situation. We get the basic situation from the police and then we ask if the victim would like to speak to an advocate. During this time when police were not arresting um, perpetrators as much right there at the home, people weren't speaking to us because they knew that when the police left, they were going to be left with this abuser and people weren't coming in. And we saw a drastic decrease in the percentage of people from police initiated calls who were willing to speak to advocates who had a safe number to give to our legal advocate to make a follow up call. Whereas if people are being arrested at the point then people feel a little safer. It gives them a little time, even if they're only holding them for a day or two. It can be that wake up call Nancy talked about, but it can also just be that time for people to get to safety that is so, so crucial. So it's, it's the combination of the coercive power of the state and law enforcement to basically set a line, combined with the, uh, with the services that you provide. I wanna, I wanna share with you an experience that I had um, I had a situation where my upstairs neighbor, uh, my upstairs neighbor um, they, they were involved in an abusive um, uh, domestic partner relationship. And at one, one time I heard some uh, very uh, distressing uh, noises. I, I ran upstairs, burst into the apartment, and uh, he was um, full on wailing on her. Um, I pulled him off and threw him up against the wall and she jumped on me and started wailing on me. Right? And then I left and, and uh, called uh, the police and, and uh, everything calmed down from there. Um, but here's the thing. When I burst into that place, um, yes, I stopped the violence, but she didn't know what I was going to do. Right? I was then, then the, the person who broke into their home. 
right? And, and it's just such a complicated situation. How does that function? And, and really it was the officers in their uniforms uh, providing that sort of sense of, of the state, you know, and, and making sure that everybody was safe that uh, uh, allowed this situation to de-escalate. And then from there, there were uh, discussions and so on and so forth. I lost track of what happened after that, but, but there was never a recurrence, I can, I can tell you that. Uh, you're very familiar with those kinds of stories, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me just, again, I think that really speaks to the individual nature um, of the case. We had a case where a um, woman was being beat up, sent her six-year-old child across the street to get the neighbors for help. The neighbors came in um, and, and got him off of her, and she was extremely grateful. So again, I think that really speaks to um, what Elizabeth said, is that every case is individual, and you, and you have to stay aware of that, and you have to provide your services based upon where that um, survivor is and what services that person is asking for and wanting at that time. We have a number of, of questions about people um, with disabilities and, and how that, uh, that functions and how you serve uh, those communities uh, that have particular problems, um, sometimes in communication, sometimes in, in just receiving the, the appropriate services. Does anybody want to comment on the kinds of, of situations that you've encountered and how you've responded to those special needs? So. First of all, I'd say that I did see in the question, somebody asked specifically about deaf and hard of hearing. We are in the process of expanding our shelter and we're making sure that one of our rooms has hardlined a um, visual doorbell as well as a visual um, smoke detector, fire alarm, and all of those things and that they're hardwired into specific rooms. Um, and that's something we do for a number of places. We have some specialized bathrooms that have specific washing type areas for certain cultures and things like that. We are fortunate to have a facility that was built specifically for us in January of 2019. So it's very new. It was built just for this purpose. It is a trauma-informed building and that is a huge, we're extremely fortunate to be in this facility, but we certainly designed it so that it is um, friendly to people with wheelchairs. We have a number of, a couple of people here with wheelchairs right now, one child and one adult, who are able to navigate our building well. We spend a lot of money on interpretation. We make sure that we have in-person interpretation available as much as absolutely possible and phone interpretation when necessary. Um, our belief is that we just do what we need to do to meet people's needs, and then we'll, we will find the money to do it. Um, and that just has to be the answer, right? You just have to meet people's needs first. We just asked a very interesting question on, on the role of tech and whether it uh, affects um, uh, domestic violence by empowering perpetrators, empowering victims, or has a kind of a neutral impact. In other words, uh, empowers uh, both sides or, or ships. And we. It was interesting. It, it, there was a 50% respondent uh, rate on saying that it, it empowers victims. 33% uh, also said that it's, it empowers perpetrators. And the balance um, had a neutral impact. What is your view of how technology, um, which I know that you use, right? I mean, people are calling you through mobile devices, texting you, and so on and so forth. How does that affect uh, the national um, uh, perspective, Deborah? Sure. So NNEDV has a project called Safety Net, um, which focuses on the intersection of, of technology and abuse and works to address how technology impacts the safety and privacy and accessibility and civil rights of victims. So in general, you know, it's not surprising that your poll was split because technology has a major impact on survivors' lives, both positive and negative. So every survivor has the right to uh, use technology in a safe and meaningful way. So survivors have the right to engage, speak out, speak up, and communicate with their family and friends and government systems and more without fear of abuse. And we also know that safety uh, technology is a lifeline to safety too. Um, and unfortunately, not all of all the technology that so many of us take for granted because of high cost or lack of access is available in all communities. So when we think about the ways in which technology can be used to increase access, keep communities connected, hold systems and offenders accountable, we have to look at those inequities too. But we cannot forget that a major focus of our work um, 
is that looking at how technology is often misused by abusive partners and perpetrators against victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, stalking and trafficking. So we work to stop what's called tech facilitated uh, abuse. Um, so some abusive partners will uh, misuse technology to stalk or track a partner's activities on a computer or tablet or mobile device. Uh, and uh, we, as we were talking about before, we do want to increase survivor safety, but we have to hold um, bad actors accountable for their, um, their use of that technology, their misuse of that technology. So we do things like conduct safety planning strategies and trainings about soft words and locking down accounts, documenting incidents of abuse. We have um, toolkits and tip sheets. We have apps. We have the Tech Safety app, which contains information that can help someone identify um, tech facilitated abuse if they're not familiar with it. And this year, we also launched our new app, DocuSafe, which is a tool to help survivors document and track evidence of, of abuse so that it can be used later if they are trying to hold um, perpetrators accountable. So let's, let's go around the virtual room. Uh, we'll start with Elizabeth, uh, Nancy, and then we'll end with you, Deborah. If there's one thing that uh, you would like to uh, be able to do, Elizabeth, in your region, in, in, um, in the greater Columbus area, and then Nancy in Atlanta, and then Deborah on a national basis, um, what would the one thing be to really have a positive impact on the people that you serve? Elizabeth, let's start with you. That's a really hard question. <laughs> Everything's so individualized, but I suppose our one answer is not going to be that surprising that right now in Columbus and around um, the country, it's housing. If we could have more affordable housing, um, it would be significantly helpful in getting people back on their feet and out of shelter sustainably. Got it. I think I think what I would say is I want I want people to know I want survivors to know that we're still here. I want survivors to know that our services are open and available. I want them to know that we're safe. Um, and that if they are able to reach out, that we will uh, assist them in a safe, um, a safe manner. And I want people to know that because of COVID, I hate COVID, but there's been a lot of government funding available to help with immediate needs, to help with rental payments, to help with transportation and, and food and those immediate needs um, that survivors that are out in the community are struggling with. So I want them to know, reach out to us. We have resources. We will walk with you. The community cares and we care. And your view about the importance of awareness, Nancy, has application in Columbus and your view about housing has application in Atlanta, doesn't it, Nancy, right? Yeah, absolutely. We are fortunate to have a, a fairly large uh, supportive housing program. We have um, about 170 people in supportive housing right now, and of those, about 120 are children. So it is a really good feeling to know that um, kids that would be even more traumatized through COVID at least are in a safe, peaceful environment. Um, but absolutely, we work with a number of continuums of care to continue to look at how can we make, um, and, and it has to be decent housing. It's not just housing. It has to be safe housing. It has to be decent housing. It has to be housing that when the survivor moves there um, with his or her family, that they feel like they're creating a good living environment for their family. So how to get that good, safe, positive community-based housing available uh, to all the survivors in the community. And Deborah, your, your brief is to basically affect the policymakers on a federal level. How, what would you have them do to help yes. deal with this scourge? Sorry, yes. Um, it, it's that and also to provide you know, assistance for all the work that we are, we're talking about. Um, you know, like a lawyer, I was going to answer your, what is your one thing with a compound answer? Because it's true. Like, first, we have to, we have to let people know that help is available. We are trying to get out the word in all kinds of different ways, public service announcement, all that. And yes, housing is critically important. I do want to say that we put out an annual report called the um, Domestic Violence Counts Report. And last year before COVID, we did a 24-hour snapshot. And over 11,000 requests for services in a 24-hour snapshot uh, went unmet. And 70% of that was for, for housing and emergency shelter. And we know that when we come out with the results of that, 
in the next few months, it's likely going to be worse. It's likely going to be impacted by COVID. And all of that, we take all of that, I will answer the question, we take all of that information so that we can go to Congress and we can say, we must do more. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, some of the federal funds that we've fought for have gotten where they should, right, have gotten to local programs. But so far in the all the COVID packages Congress has considered, we've only been able to secure $45 million. Um, and that is not enough. We are, we are the, the packages so far don't have enough funding to make their way across the entire United States. They don't um, help uh, victims of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. um, there's more that needs to be done and um, there is no funding for culturally specific programs. And so we are urging Congress in the next package to make sure the next COVID stimulus package um, that they include more funding for domestic violence and sexual assault survivors with a focus on the disproportionality of how this pandemic is affecting communities of color. Such an important issue. I'd like to thank you all for your work to help uh, the victims of domestic violence. Um, I'd like to just really uh, express my own appreciation for the points that you're making. Elizabeth Abdur Rahim, Executive Director of uh, Choices for Victims of Domestic Violence in the Columbus, Ohio region. Nancy Freoff, President and CEO of a, a Partnership Against Domestic Violence in Atlanta. And Deborah Vagans, uh, President and CEO of the National Network to End Domestic Violence in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for your work, for your healing. And that's the nonprofit report. Thank you all for attending and have a great day. Stay safe, everyone, and let's keep up this fight to end domestic violence. Absolutely.